Everybody said, Good evening, everyone. I can't hear my people. I said, Good evening, everyone. God bless you today. And the glory of God be upon your life. And everything the Lord wants to impart unto you, you will receive and benefit in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for leadership development. Thank you for every leader here, every brother, every sister, every pastor, every overseer. We're asking, O oh Lord, that you impart leadership qualities into every life in Jesus' name. Our leadership will not remain stagnant. We're moving forward. We're moving higher. And we'll be more productive in leadership in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We've been going through a series of studies on leadership. And we've been making use of the letters of the word leadership. And we've gone through L E A D E R S H. And now we come to the letter I. Tonight we're talking about integrity. Integrity is very important, very essential in leadership. The topic is the integrity of an invincible leader. That word invincible means unconquerable. And it means unbendable. And it means uncompromisable. It means a leader who is standing, a leader who knows where he's going, a leader who knows his calling and is to, to that calling. Unconquerable, unstoppable, unbendable, invincible. The integrity of an invincible leader. We're coming to First Kings chapter 9. And we're reading from verse 4. First Kings chapter 9, verse 4. And if thou wilt walk before me, as David thy father walked in the integrity of heart. That's the word there, please underline. In integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgments. Then, verse 5, on the basis of that integrity of heart, on account of that integrity in leadership, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever. As I promised to David, thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. Let's come to Job chapter 2. Reading from verse 3, and you will see the price, you'll see the value, the esteem that God places on integrity. We're looking at Job chapter 2, reading from verse 3, and the Lord said unto Satan, As thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and his choice shuns evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. He has pain, he holds on to his integrity. He does not understand everything that is happening, and yet he holds on to his integrity. And you moved me, although thou moved me against him to destroy him without cause. And yet he was holding on to his integrity. And God took note of that. And heaven took note of that. In Job chapter 27. Job, reading from chapter 27, verses 5 and 6. 
God forbid that I should justify you. Till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. You know, he was sick. You know, it was uh, kind of criticized. You know, he was condemned by his friends. And he said, whatever you say, whatever you think, and whatever you do, and however I feel, and whatever peril may be in front of me, there is one thing I'm going to hold on to until my last breath, and that is my integrity. Verse 6, my righteousness, I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live integrity. We're coming to Psalm 78. In Psalm 78, we're reading from verses 70 all through to 72. Psalm 78, verse 70. He chose David also, a servant, and he took him from the sheepfolds, from following the youth great, the youth great, but young. He brought him to feed Jacob his people, and Israel his inheritance. Look at how David did it. So he fed them, so he served them, so he took care of them, so he fought their battles, so he developed them, so he uplifted them, he fed them. That's all what it means as a king, as a leader. Over the children of Israel, he did all that, and everything summarized as he fed them according to the integrity of his heart. According to the integrity of his heart, he guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. The virtue of integrity is essential in leadership. It is indispensable in leadership. And such leaders who have integrity, they are being to God in the Old Testament, they are being to Christ in the New Testament, and they have had, number one, conversion and distinction. Number one, they are converted and different. They are not like every Jack and every person, every Tom and Harry. They are converted and they're different. If you're going to have integrity, integrity approved of God, integrity observed by God, there must be conversion and distinction. They're totally different from the people around you. Number two, they're consecrated and devoted. The people who have integrity are the people that have laid everything on the altar. And they have said, I bind my sacrifice on the horns of the altar. And I'm going to serve God with everything I've got without ever deviating. They are consecrated and devoted. Number three, they are courageous and disciplined. Challenges will come. Opposition might come. And things like that happen to Job that you may not understand, but you see, people that have integrity, they are courageous and they are disciplined. They don't throw themselves away into the river. Just because there's a challenge, just because the things that does so, they cannot understand, they don't give up and throw their conviction away and throw their lives away and just raise their hands in helplessness and say, I cannot do it again. They are courageous and they are disciplined. Number four, they are confident and dutiful. That, that's, a, that's a very reason why they have integrity. They are confident in God. God gave me the work. God gave me the assignment. God gave me this thing to do. He cannot abandon me. He's going to stay with me. I trust him. I believe him. They are confident. And because of that, they are dutiful. They don't uh, kind of moderate their duty because of the climate. 
because of the circumstances, because of challenges around them, they say, I have spoken to the Lord that I will obey him, I will do his word, I will do his will, and I'm committed to that, whatever wind may be blowing. Number five, they are consistent and dependable. You'll find them there when you need them. You'll find them there when the work is at its height. You'll find them there, whatever rain or sunshine, they're consistent. They're always there. That's the meaning of the fact that they, they have integrity. Number six, they are conscientious and diligent. They don't do things haphazardly. Their whole heart is there. Their whole mind is there. They carry their conscience into the work. They carry their conscience into their duty. And they are conscientious and diligent. Number seven, they are convinced, they are decisive. They are convinced this is why I came to this world. They are convinced this is why I am in this church. They are convinced this is the only place I can be. And this is the only thing I can do. I have a calling. And there is no doubt about it, night or day, any time a duty demands, I must be there. They are convinced and they are decisive. As we look at integrity today, we're not going to run through too many books of the Bible. If you, we're going to concentrate on such a leader, a leader that adds integrity manifested integrity, demonstrated integrity, and showed forth integrity in everything that he did from the time the Bible records about his life until he passed on to glory. We're looking at the man Joseph. Joseph. As we look at the integrity of an invincible leader, we're going to pick up the story of the life and the ministry and the duties and the activities of Joseph. Point number one, the development of an invincible leader. The development, that man developed and you will develop. I said you will develop. The development of an invincible leader. Remember once again, it's not invisible. That's a different word. This one is invincible. It means unconquerable. It means unbendable. It means undefeatable. If there's a word like that, you cannot defeat him. It means indestructible. It means that whatever happens and whatever water may pass under the bridge, the man was unconquerable, invincible. Number one, the development of an invincible leader. Point number two, the dedication of an incorruptible leader. A leader who is going to have recognition from heaven. A leader who is going to have the work that God has committed to his son backed up by heaven backed up by grace, backed up by the Spirit of God, backed up by everything that he needs in a sufficient measure. That leader must be incorruptible, and that leader must be dedicated to the service of the work the Lord has called him to. Point number two, the dedication of an incorruptible leader. Point number three now, the destiny of an indestructible leader. You couldn't destroy that man. Whatever happened, whatever friends did, whatever foes did, whatever his relations did, and whatever the foreigners did, whatever the sons of Jacob did, and whatever Potiphar's house did, you couldn't destroy that man. You couldn't destroy his dream. You couldn't destroy his personality. You couldn't destroy anything about him. The destiny of an indestructible leader. Point number one. Somebody there, please tell me point number one. The development of an invincible leader. 
Once again, we're going to use that word leadership. And Joseph was a modern leader. And we can see, number one, Joseph was a learner. A leader is a learner. You have to keep on learning, keep on learning. That's what makes you a real leader. You don't get to the point where I know it all, I've heard it all. You keep on learning. Now, why do we refer to Joseph as a learner? He came to the land of Egypt. And in Genesis, I'm reading from chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42. Look at something here concerning Joseph, a learner. And you're asking yourself, am I a learner? Am I a learner? Genesis chapter 42, we're reading from verse 21. 42 verse 21, and he said one to another, We're verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we sought the anguish of his soul when he besought us. And they would not, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Speak I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child. And ye would not hear. Therefore behold, also its blood is required. Now look at verse 23. They and they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. You know what that means? He had mastered the language of Egypt. And he had mastered the use of that language that he can speak now directly in the language of the Egyptians. And then somebody else was interpreting to his brothers. And his brothers couldn't detect the intonation of their family. They couldn't detect that this man uh, was actually part of them. He was a learner. He had learned the language. When he did learn the language, they sold him to Egypt. And the moment he landed, he knew, I must communicate. I must relate to other people. And he picked up the language in Potiphar's house. And then in the prison, and everywhere he was, he had picked up the language. He was a learner. And of course, you know, he also learned administration. He learned organization. He learned about leadership. So that when eventually he became the head and the leader over Egypt, he learned everything so perfectly. The Egyptians had no complaint about his administration, his organization. He was a learner. Number two, he is an inquirer. Inquirer. A leader must be inquiring, asking questions. You ask questions from the members. How do I help you? What do you need? What is it we should be dealing with? How can I minister to your need? Let's come to Genesis. And I'm reading from chapter 40, reading from verse 6. 40, reading from verse 6. He was an inquirer. In verse 6 it says, And Joseph came in unto them in the morning, and he looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers, he asked them, he inquired from them that were with him in the watch of the Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sad today? He could pick up, they were sad, just looking at their faces, and just looking at their behavior, and just looking at their actions, and just looking at their fear and their absent-mindedness. Then he asked them, a leader must be an inquirer. A leader only knows, you know, I prepared my message. I don't know what's happening to the people. They will even say, I don't know what's happening to you there. I don't know your concern here, but I have the word of God for you. Are you going to apply the word to me if you don't know what I'm going through? Are you going to give me appropriate counseling? You know? If you don't know what I'm going through, and when people come for counseling, 
they, they never asked any question. The people tell their own side of the story. And they do not inquire. A leader, number one, is a learner. Number two, is an inquirer. Number three, now, A, is an achiever. An achiever. A person who is a leader and he never achieves anything, you cannot say, since he became our leader, we cannot point to this thing that he had achieved. How are you a leader then? A leader is a learner. A leader is an inquirer. A leader is an achiever. Look at chapter 41. In chapter 41, I'm reading from verse 46. Chapter 41, reading from verse 46, and Joseph was 30 years, he uh, was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. That man was active. And that man was a man that knew I must achieve. The seven years of plenty had come. We need to gather all the grace. And he went through. He didn't just delegate. Okay, you go there, you go there, you go there. He himself went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered, look at that, and he gathered, he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities, the food of the fields, which was round about every city, every city, and laid he, laid he up the same. He was an achiever. You see, in leadership, you must have a goal. You must have a dream. You must have an ideal. By the end of this month, this is what I intend to achieve. By the end of this program, this is what I want to achieve. At the end of this Easter retreat, and people come to the Lord, and I have those decision sleeves, this is what I want to achieve as I bring God the lives of the people in the local church, in the district church, in the group, in the state, in the region. This is my expectation. And this is what I'm driving at. You will be an achiever in Jesus' name. D, he was a developer. A developer. You understand? Seven years of plenty were coming. And now he must develop the plan. He must develop the strategy. A leader is a developer. You develop plans. How do I achieve this? How do I have that? A leader must be a developer. Look at chapter 41. I'm reading from verse 37. Chapter 41, reading from verse 37. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh. And in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? The Spirit of God in him was not dormant, was not quiet. After he interpreted the dream, then he said, all these seven years of plenty, let Pharaoh do this. That's developing a plan. That's developing a strategy. As we're going to have this surplus and we're going to have this, let us have this plan in place. In verse 39, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Do you develop any plan at all? And do you do anything at all in the district that will show that you develop a plan? Look at verse 46. And Joseph was 30 years uh, old. You know, we read that before. Go to verse 49. Uh, and Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. Gathering the corn, that's one thing. 
But the corn is going to stay for seven years. Some of them, some of the corn for five years. And some of the corn will stay for two years because you have seven year period of the plenty. And then it's going to stay for the seven years of farming so that the people will still have something to eat. Joseph, how are you going to do it that while you are gathering, the rats will not come in and eat everything up? And the animals will not come in and eat everything up. He said, I'm developing a plan for that. Are you going to do it that the corn will not get rotting and the climate will not destroy everything? I'm developing a plan to do that. You must look at your head and you must envisage in leadership. This problem might crop up. I develop a strategy to solve that problem. This challenge might come. I develop a strategy to uh, make sure that those things did not uh, actually spoil what we're doing. L, a leader is a learner. E, a leader is an inquirer. A, a leader is an achiever. D, a leader is a developer. E, a leader is an enabler. Enabler. He enables people to do what is to be done, obviously. Gathering all the corn, getting to the field, carrying it in sacks or bags, depositing it in the, in the storehouse, and making sure that everything is protected. It's not, one, it's not a one-man business. He needs to bring other people in, and he needs to develop those other people. He needs to enable those other people. He needs to teach them what to do so that they walk along with him. Joseph was a great leader. He was an enabler. Look at uh, Psalm 105, Psalm 105, and I'm reading from verse 17. Psalm 105, we're reading from verse 17. It says in verse 17, Psalm 105, he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose speech they heard with, with fetters, and he was laid in iron until the time of his word came. The time of your word will come. It has come. The word of the Lord tried him. The king said, and loosed him. You are loosed. You are set free. Even the ruler of the people, and he let him go free. Are you there? Every fetter that binds you is broken in Jesus' name. And he made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance. Look at verse 22. To bind, to discipline his princes at pleasure. Tell me the latter part, the last part of verse 22. Say it again. Say it aloud in unison. To teach his senators wisdom. He enabled those senators. Those senators had never seen anything like that before. Seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And then Joseph began to teach them. He began to instruct them. This is what it will look like. If we eat up everything in the seven plenteous years, the famine is coming, and we do not save for the days of the famine. The nation is going to be at risk. The economy is going to fall, and inflation is going to come. Everything will totally go down, and the stock market and everything will tell us that now we're at the lowest end in a century for hundreds of years. This has not happened. This is going to happen. And he was teaching those senators. He enabled them. He was an enabler. Are a restorer. You will be a restorer. We're coming to Daniel. We're coming to Genesis chapter 14. A restorer. A restorer. In uh, chapter uh, chapter 40, verse 13. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place. He was actually interpreting the dream 
of this man that was a servant of Pharaoh. And through his interpretation, and through his encouragement, and through his counseling, he restored that man to the office. That's what the man felt. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, and he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And he gave the cup unto Pharaoh, the, unto Pharaoh's hand. Will be repairers, will be restorers. When people's lives are down and they do not know how they are going to make it, you'll see upliftment, restoration comes from God. I am a restorer. I said, I am a restorer. Say it for yourself. I am a restorer. Isaiah chapter 58, we're reading from verse 12. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 12. And they that be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. How Joseph restored joy in the whole of the country. How he restored hope for the whole of the country. How he restored liveliness to the whole country. Because he made himself available and capable to do what ought to be done. El, a learner. E, an inquirer. A, an achiever. D, a developer. E, an enabler. And R, a restorer. S, a sufferer. A sufferer. That man suffered. And yet, even though he suffered, he knew, he knew that he suffered. Look at his comment and look at the name he gave to, his, uh, to one of his uh, two sons in uh, chapter 41. I'm reading from verse 52. Chapter 41. We're reading from verse, uh, 40, uh, so from verse 42. Joseph was a sufferer. A sufferer. We're reading from chapter 41 and verse 52. And the name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction, in the land of my suffering. But you know, there are many people that allow suffering to pass them by, just like that, and they do not make good use of the suffering. Joseph was a sufferer. Let me show you something in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 8. You may want to underline this in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Though he were his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Yet learnt he obedience by the things which he suffered. He learnt obedience by the things which he suffered. He learnt submission by the things which he suffered. Uh, you know, Joseph, Joseph had been the talking type when he was in his father's house, when he was much younger. I had a dream, I had a dream. He suffered for that. Now he got to Egypt. He didn't talk about that again. He learned quietness and submission. As he went about through all the land of Egypt to gather the corn. Why? How could he do that? He had learned organization in the place and the country of his affliction. He suffered in the suffering. He learned organization. He learned quietness, he learned submission, he learned organization, he learned administration in the, in the place of his suffering. Yes, he was suffering, a sufferer, but he learned administration. When he got to the prison, he suffered there, but then it was in those places of suffering, he learned all the qualities that now made him a leader. Have you suffered in your life persecution, misunderstanding, criticism, injustice? Learn. Whatever it is, 
you learn wisdom from the things which you have suffered. Look at First Peter. In First Peter, I'm reading from chapter four. First Peter, chapter four, and we're reading from verse fifteen. First Peter, chapter four, verse fifteen. It says, "But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer, or as a busybody." In other men's matters, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Let your suffering bring glory to God and growth to you. Let's come back now. As a sufferer, age a helper. Age a helper. Pharaoh was at sea. Pharaoh did not know what he would do. Pharaoh had a dream. Seven years of plenty, seven years of farming. What can we do? And what can we apply? What principle can we apply? And then uh, Joseph came in and he was a helper. You'll be a helper. In the church, you'll be a helper. In your family, you'll be a helper. That's why you are there. That's why you are in the world. You are to be a helper. Look at uh, chapter 49. God helped him. And then he carried that help to the people of God. We're looking at chapter 49, verse 22 and verse 25. Verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well whose, whose branches run over the wall. Verse 25, even by the God of thy father who shall help thee by the Almighty. The Almighty will help you. He'll give you the wisdom you never possessed. He'll give you the breakthrough you never thought of in your life in Jesus' name. And by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with the blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies under, and blessings of the breast and of the womb. Let's come to chapter 39. Chapter 39. He was a helper. He was a helper. Anywhere he found himself, always helping, always helping. You're a helper too. Genesis 39. We're reading from verse 3. In verse 3 it says, And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and, uh, and he made him overseer over all his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. He said, this man will add value. This man will add glory. This man will add prosperity. Put him in charge. Leave him there. Put him there. Don't disturb him. Don't hinder him. He is a plus. He is a helper. That is what you will be. You'll be a help in the church. A help to every family. And when people see you, they will just breathe down and say, my problems are solved. He has, she has the spirit of God. Everything will be all right. Look at that same chapter. I'm reading from verse 21, chapter 39, verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph, and he showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. We have nothing to lose by leaving everything into his hands because he is a helper. I, an interpreter. I, an interpreter. He was an interpreter to those prisoners and he was an interpreter to Pharaoh himself. 
and it is that interpretation of another person's dream that brought the fulfillment of his own dream in chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, we're reading from verse 11. And we dreamed a dream. In one night, I and he we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. Look at verse 15. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. I thought you'd say amen. Peace in your life. Peace in your family. And peace in the work of your hand in Jesus' name. This leader, invincible. And, and you see why it's invincible? Why it's unconquerable? You see why? Wherever he was, put him in the mortar, pound him, and beat him, but he'll come out stronger. Wherever you are now, whatever is happening now, you'll come out stronger. Because L, you're a learner. E, you're an inquirer. A, you're an achiever. D, you're a developer. E, you're an enabler. R, you're a restorer. S, you're a sufferer. H, you're a helper. And I, you are an interpreter. P, you are a preserver. Preserver. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 45. That's who a leader is. A leader is to preserve. The doctrine that is in your hand, you don't, you know, make a mess of it. Preserve it. The souls that are given to you, you don't make a mess of those souls. Preserve the souls. That's leadership. That you are able to preserve the souls that uh, were given into your hand. We're looking at Genesis 45, verse 5. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Preserve, to preserve life. And I pray that all these qualities will shine forth in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now, the dedication of an incorruptible leader. Look at this, Joseph, incorruptible. We're coming to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39, we're reading from verse 8. In verse 8, it says, but he refused. The wife of Potiphar had appealed to him that, you know, he should commit sin with her. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master knoweth not what is not. What is with me in the house? And he has committed all that he has into my hand. There is nothing, there is there is none greater in this house than I, neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And then the woman became so passionate about it and said, now that we're alone together, this must happen. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, the latter part of verse 12, and he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. That man was incorruptible. You are incorruptible. Satan cannot corrupt you. The society cannot corrupt you. Sinners and tempters and temptresses will not corrupt you in Jesus' name. But you know, it's not enough to just say, I'm holy, I'm incorruptible, I'm righteous, and we do nothing. 
Joseph a dedication. Dedication. That's the beauty of the life of Joseph. Incorruptible, yes, but what's the use of somebody who's incorruptible but useless? Incorruptible but will not run any errand. Incorruptible but will not do anything. It's incorruptible. It's always staying in the house. It cannot evangelize. It cannot teach. It cannot counsel. It cannot sing. It cannot pray. It cannot do anything. But it's incorruptible. It's a kind of worthless servant, even though it's incorruptible. But in the case of Joseph, incorruptible, yes, but he had dedication. Look at chapter 37. Chapter 37, I'm reading from verse 13. Chapter 37, verse 13, And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in shaking. Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said, Here am I. You know, you could have said, Oh, daddy, you know that this my brothers, they don't like me. They hate me. I'm afraid to go alone and be with them. He was dedicated. You'll not be afraid of duty in Jesus' name. Chapter 39, I'm reading from verse 21. Chapter 39, verse 21. Look at what it says here in verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison he got to the prison he could have said enough is enough you know this world in which we live now they don't appreciate duty or dutifulness they don't appreciate dedication i served that man potiphar and he should have known his wife that his wife is a licentious woman his life is a lustful woman. He should have known his wife. And the wife told the lie against me. He didn't even ask many questions. He put me in the prison. Enough is enough. I'm not going to serve anybody anymore. I'm not going to do anything anymore. Not Joseph. He was dedicated. He got to the prison. You couldn't see on his face that there was injustice against him. He still served. Come to chapter 40. I'm reading from verse 6. Chapter 40. And we're looking at verse 6. It says, And Joseph came in unto them in the morning, and he looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the watch of the Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? Oh, you could have said, that's none of my business. Are they sad? I am sad too. Are they unhappy? I'm unhappy too. I don't want to even talk to anybody now. What are they going through that it was sad? I saw them last night. Everything was all right. This morning, they are looking sad. Well, whatever they're thinking about, I have a lot more to think about. I'm a foreigner here. I'm a slave here. And he put me, incarcerated me in the prison without doing anything wrong. Oh God, where are you? How can a righteous man suffer like this? No, he didn't do that. He was dedicated. You'll be dedicated in Jesus' name. I appreciate your dedication, you know, coming every time like this. And when you come, I see joy on your face. I see happiness on your face. It doesn't appear that anything negative is going on outside there. But I know what is happening there. God will turn your sorrow into joy. Your sadness into happiness. Don't show it on your face. Be like Joseph. He asked them, what's the matter? And then they told him the dream. After telling him the dream, he gave them interpretation. But you know, he told that other man, he said, remember me as it's good for you. You are going back now. Talk about me to Pharaoh. Did the man talk about him immediately? He forgot for two years. And Joseph carried on. Joseph carried on. God's time is the best, no fighting, and there is no criticism, and there is no conflict, and he just carried on. A man, he was sold and addicted to a complete, a complete dedication. You'll be dedicated like that. 
and the Lord will honor your dedication in Jesus' name. You know, uh, somebody sometimes, uh, maybe some, there's a problem in the family, but you're taking care. You've done everything you ought to do. You've helped your wife. You've helped the children. You've helped your husband. But the work of God must go on. The work of God will go on. God will use you more and more in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 42. Chapter 42, and I'm reading from verse 6. Chapter 42, reading from verse 6. And Joseph was the governor over the land. And he, it was that sold to all the people of the land. Look at that. Joseph was the governor of and as a governor, he didn't say, administrator, you do that. Manager, you do that. Director, you do that. Housekeeper, you do that. And grain supervisor, you do that. He was there. It's okay to have administrator. It's okay to have all those directors. It's okay to have all the housekeepers. But he was there. You'll be there. I said you'll be there. A, a group coordinator that's always sending somebody. We're having a meeting. I apologize to the moderator. I can't come. Represent me. The next time, I'm sorry, I can't come this time. We're praying and fasting. Go and represent me. At another time, we're planning to uh, make the church, mobilize the church to go and evangelize. It's a good thing, and you know, our group, our district is going to represent it. You are going to represent me. A person like that is, for, is you know, forever idle. It's not doing anything. Represent me. Represent me. In the case of Joseph, he was the one that sold to all the people. And Joseph's brethren came. If he was sleeping at home, those brethren will come and go, and they will not recognize that they have come. They just uh, pay their money, buy the corn, and they are gone. And the dream will not be fulfilled. Your dream will be fulfilled. And they, bow, and they bowed themselves before him with their faces to the earth. That's what you call dedication. Chapter 43, I'm reading from verse 15. Chapter 43, we're looking at a verse 15. In verse 15, and the men took that present, and they took double money in their hands, and Benjamin, and rose up, and went down to Egypt, and tell me the last line there, and they stood before Joseph, he was there. He was always there. You are there. You will always be there. That's why you'll meet the right contact. That's how you'll meet the right people. That's how you will minister to the right person. And the dream of your life must be fulfilled, will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. I'll see you at the top. I said I'll see you at the top. Because, look at now, the qualities of the life of Joseph. Number one, available, available. You know, he was always there, always there. He was available. Number two, capable. Not only available, what's the use of a man, a woman, who is available, but helpless, cannot do anything, capable. The Lord will give you the skill to do everything you ought to do in Jesus' name. Number three, adaptable, adaptable. You, you know, he was like uh, the silver spoon was in his mouth when he was back at home. Now he came to Potiphar's house when he was sold as a slave. He quickly adapted himself and he did everything well. You couldn't even know he was a stranger, a foreigner. And then there was injustice, and they took him to the prison. He quickly adjusted himself. He was adaptable. And then he came before Pharaoh. They shaved his head. They cleaned him up, and he, 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 he don't earn a new garment. And he appeared before Pharaoh. He was adaptable. Now, he was, he was not to stay in one place like when he was in Potiphar's 
house or stay in one place like when he was in the prison or just uh, stand before Pharaoh all the time. He traveled here and there, here and there. He was adaptable. Whatever duty comes, whatever challenge comes, I pray you'll be adaptable in Jesus' name. Number four, he was active. There was no lazy bone inside his body. No lazy, no lazy thought within him. Up and doing. Up and doing. I'm watching a brother there up and doing. I'm watching a sister there up and doing. He was active. Number five, he was acceptable. He was acceptable. Remember, he was a foreigner. Remember, he was a slave. Remember, they bought him like you buy property. And then he came to those places and immediately acceptable. You'll be acceptable. You'll not say, they don't accept me. I want to do my best. I want to work. I want to go here and there. But you know, they reject me. Nobody will reject you. God has appointed you. We accept you. And everywhere you go, you'll be acceptable in Jesus' name. Number six, he was agreeable. Agreeable. You never find him arguing with anybody. You never find him a disagree with that. No, that will not work. No, that will not do. He got everybody around him and as he went and got all the corn in the land, everybody just followed. Always agreeing, agreeable. Can you check up your character? Can you check up your behavior? That as a leader, the people around you and the people surrounding you, you will be agreeable in Jesus' name. Number seven, he was accessible. Where is Joseph? Is there? Always there. Accessible. You'll be accessible. But you know, in a little district, we're looking for a district pastor. He's not always there. Has he traveled? No, he has not traveled. He wants to be in authority. And he wants to create an aura of a fear in the minds of the people. I'm not going to be a common man, a common leader. I'm not going to be with the people. They must make an effort, a serious effort. Before they can see me, Joseph was accessible. You'll be accessible. Number eight, it was adequate. No challenge beyond his wisdom. No challenge beyond his activity. The man was adequate. Number nine, he was accountable. Accountable. All those, uh, all the corn that he gathered in every place, he was accountable. And he took record and he supervised everything and nothing was lost. What a glorious uh, privilege that we can learn about a Joseph like this who was at that time, the whole Bible had not been written and there was no assembly, there was no fellowship, there was no church, there was no leadership training, there was no leadership development, and yet he relied on God so much, the man was accountable. We get to that storehouse, ah, what happened to this house? A storehouse, and we don't know, in the night when we were sleeping, some people have come and carried all the bags away, you know, at that time everybody was looking for food, and they were looking for corn, and he supervised everything so much that there was no theft in any place. Number 10, he was articulate. articulate. He gave instruction to the people and he taught those senators and the people didn't say, what did he say? I didn't hear very well. I don't understand. How do we carry that out? The man was audible and articulate. Number 11, he was aware, he was awakened, aware. He knew what was going on. He knew that the family was there. He knew that people are coming from all those various countries, and he knew that he must be there. He was aware. Brother, this problem is happening in your district. In my district? Who said that? I'm not aware of that. Remember, this person has been sick now for about one year in your group, in my group, I'm not aware of that. Who told you that? And when we check up, lo and behold, it is true. The man is not aware. The woman leader is not aware. You'll be awakened to duty in Jesus' name. Number 12, he was attentive. 
he was affectionate. He didn't have hatred against anybody. Even his brothers that came from home, he sold them the corn and he said, put their money back into their bags. We don't need their money. We're all right without their money. Let, let's just use that to bless them. He was affectionate and he was attentive. How about uh, your family? Oh, we have an old man who is our father. He sees you alive. Yes, alive. How many of you? They said, well, we're 12. They were telling him history, story that he knew. They said, one is back at home, the youngest, and then the other one, Joseph, is not. Ah, that one that is, uh, you know, at home, you must bring him back. If you don't bring him back, when you are coming the next time, I will take you to be spies. And then he delayed one of them, and then one was waiting here so as to make that to draw them back. That man was affectionate and attentive. That's what the Lord will do in your life today. In your leadership today. You are going to return to another leader in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the destiny of an indestructible leader. Any indestructible leader here tonight? Where is he? What is she? Nothing will destroy you. Nothing will destroy your destiny. Nothing will destroy your dream. And when we begin to take account later, you say, I have a testimony. Everything about Joseph has been reproduced, replicated in my life, and my dream has not been destroyed. And your destiny has not been destroyed. The destiny of an indestructible leader. Let's look at chapter, 50, chapter 49 of the Genesis. Genesis chapter 49. And I'm reading here from verse 23. Genesis chapter 49, verse 23. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him. And hated him. Verse 26. For the blessings of thy father has prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors. Even though they have shot at you, even though there is persecution, you are going to be an overcomer. I said you are already an overcomer. Let me give you a verse you need to remember. You know, you know the verse, but you need to remember this is for you. Say, this is for me. Look at Romans chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. Joseph could have said that. All things work together for good for me. My people hated me. My people sold me to Egypt. But if his wife told a lie against me, they sent me into the prison, and I sat there, I interpreted the dreams for them, and they forgot me. But as I look at it now, as the Lord fulfilled the dream, I can say now, I know that all things work together for good for me, because I love God, and it works for good for me because I am called according to his purpose. It will work for you. Because we know that all things work together for good for you. Because you love God. And because you are called according to his purpose. Joseph had a dream. Joseph had a destiny which nothing on earth Nothing from hell could destroy him. He was persecuted. The dream remained. There were plots and plans. The dream remained. There was pain, the pain of injustice. The dream remained. There were profligates that told lies against him and threw him into the prison. The dream remained. There was punishment, unjust punishment. The dream remained. Prison also came. The poverty of his slave also had pressure on him. Powerful personalities were against him. Yet, they could not drown his dream, 
nor destroy his destiny. Nothing will hinder your destiny. Nothing will destroy your destiny. Nothing could hinder or deny or delay or prevent Joseph's destiny. By grace and godliness, he had, number one, peace despite injustice. You see, the injustice against him, there's no confusion. I'm confused. What have I done? Have I not gone this way and gone that way? He had peace despite injustice. Number two, he had purity with incorruptibility. I'll keep my integrity. I'll keep my incorruptibility. Number three, he had power over and against immorality. The moral woman came, but he said, I will not succumb. You will not succumb. Number four, he had Patience during imprisonment. Oh Lord, that's not what you promised me. You said they're going to bow down to me and you will make my sheep to be standing while the others fall. Is this a fulfillment of the dream? No question. Number four, patience during imprisonment. Number five, preservation of innocence. His innocence was preserved. He'll preserve your innocence in Jesus' name. Number six, perseverance before intervention. The Lord is going to intervene in your case. It's going to make negative to become positive. It's going to turn things around for the better in your life. Then, but keep on persevering. It will be all right before long. Number seven, the priority of integrity. Yeah, that's the priority. And he said, I will not give up. I will not drop my integrity. I'm going to stay and abide by the will of God. Pray today and receive the same grace God gave to Joseph. Before you, there's a bright future. God will take you from the dungeon and then he will bring you to the fulfillment of your dream and destiny in Jesus' name. All things will work together for you in this life and in the life to come, everlasting life in Jesus' name. Are you there? Are you ready for that destiny to be unfolded tonight? Rise up now and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. Integrity, integrity. I'm going to be a real leader. Thank you, Lord, for what you're developing in me. I'll be a learner. I'll be an inquirer. I'll be an achiever. I'll be a developer. I'll be an enabler. I'll be a restorer, a repairer, a sufferer for, for good purpose and profit, a helper, an interpreter, a preserver, and God will raise you up. You'll be at the top in Jesus' name. Open your mouth now. Open your mouth now. Personalize everything you have learned. Glory, brightness, and grace before you are ahead of you. Keep on moving. Don't go back. Don't look back. The Lord will definitely promote you.